So you've just picked up RimWorld for the first time and you have no idea what you're doing. Dropping into your first game can be pretty daunting and leave you with a ton of unanswered questions. Where did all my food go? Why is that person setting all those fires? Who exactly is Randy and why does he hate me? Lesser mortals might be tempted to give up and beg Steam for a refund almost immediately, but not you. No, no, you're committed, or at least you should be. So for those of you who want to survive and dare I say thrive out here on the rim, I present to you the absolute beginner's guide to RimWorld. This guide will act as a basic introduction to the vanilla game as of version 1.3 and won't cover any mods or the royalty or ideology DLC. It will, however, take you from landing your first colonists on the rim through the day-to-day -day management of your colony and right up until launching your first ship back into space, if you're lucky. RimWorld is at its heart a story generator, and each story in RimWorld starts with a scenario. You can choose from any of these scenarios to begin your adventure, or even download a custom scenario from Steam Workshop. You could even be so bold as to make your own. This guide will assume that you're using the crash landed scenario, which starts you off with three colonists, a handful of resources, and a random companion animal. The next step is choosing an AI storyteller and a difficulty level. The storyteller will determine the types of random events that can happen during your game, and will have a great influence on how your colony's story develops. Phoebe Chillax will give you long periods of rest, punctuated with bigger difficulty spikes in the form of raids and other challenges. Cassandra Classic, is the default storyteller and will ramp up the amount and challenge of events over time as your colony grows, but will still give you some time to recover. And then there's Randy Random. Randy will throw events at you at any time, regardless of difficulty, and is prone to launch several existential threats at your colony in quick succession. The difficulty level will make the game easier or harder based on several different factors, such as threat scale, mood bonuses, and the number of times your colony might be hit with diseases over a given period of time. I recommend Strive to Survive for any first time players, as it balances out challenging gameplay with a broad experience of the game's multiple mechanics. The last thing to decide here is whether or not to play in commitment mode. This is the game's permadeath mode, and is how the game was meant to be played. You cannot reload a past save to fix mistakes, and every twist in the tale, whether good or bad, is permanent. I recommend using reload anytime mode when you're new to the game, to make the learning curve less punishing. And I strongly advise not using commitment mode when using mods in case they break your game. The next step is choosing your seed and the size of the planet you want to start with, but none of these options are likely to matter to you when you're just starting out. So pick a seed named from whatever funny word you want and move on. You'll then be faced with your new world. Doesn't it look nice? Your next job is picking what type of biome you want to land in. These range from luscious plains to inhospitable deserts to thick sheets of ice and carry with them multiple pros and cons depending on the type of playthrough you're aiming for. And yes, people do play on ice sheets by choice. Ideally, you want a biome with a growing season that lasts from spring to fall if not the entire year. So for first timers, I recommend picking a temperate forest biome. You'll also want to consider the terrain types on offer when picking your starting location. Flat terrain will lack essential materials like metal and stone, and might be harder to defend from raiders, but make up for it in plenty of space to expand your base as your colony grows. Small hills will have more of these materials, but won't provide a lot of protection. And large hills will have a tons of materials and plenty of rock walls to build up against. Even mountain bases have their benefits, as they're easy to defend and will give you plenty of stone and metals, but will take longer to dig into in the early game and leave you open to bug infestations. And let me tell you, those bugs aren't friendly. The final step before jumping into the game proper is choosing your starting colonists. Think of this screen as a bit like a character sheet in a traditional role-playing game. Your task here is to keep randomizing the characters until you get the skills, traits, and backgrounds you desire. Remember that your characters can only do one thing at a time and will need to eat, rest, and relax at some points. So you want to make sure to start with a group of colonists with a good mix of skills. Stay away from colonists incapable of too many tasks, especially ones with incapable of skilled labor. You want at least two of your colonists to be capable of menial or dumb labor too. Passions, those little flame icons next to each skill, 
are nearly as important as rolling a high number, as your pawn will level up skills they're passionate about much faster and they'll get a higher mood bonus for doing work they're passionate about. The most important skills in the early game are medical, plants and shooting. Try to have at least one pawn who can do each skill. It also helps to have someone who is reasonably good at cooking, intellectual, social and construction, plus mining if you're starting with a mountain base. Lacking these skills in the early game is less likely to lead to a game over, but having them will certainly speed up your advancement. Traits don't really matter too much, and re-rolling characters just to get good traits can be super tedious. However, there are traits you should try to avoid. For instance, anything that gives a permanent mood or speed penalty, such as lazy, pessimist, or depressive. You should be especially careful to avoid traits like pyromaniac, but I'm pretty sure I don't need to tell you why. Finally, try not to take colonists with a lot of health ailments, as taking care of sick pawns is a full-time task in and of itself. And avoid pawns who start with drug addictions. They'll pick those up in no time on their own. Trust me. So you've just landed, your pawns are running around and you're quickly losing daylight. You got a whole bunch of buttons in front of you and no idea how they work. Are you lost yet? Okay, don't panic. Let's go over them one by one. First of all, pause. That's right, you could just pause the game whenever. Just hit your space bar and boom, everything stops. Cool, right? You can stop the game whenever you need to chill out, take stock, and plan your next steps. Speaking of, once your pawns are on the ground, you'll notice you've got a few items lying around your starting location. This will include a rifle, a pistol, and a plasteel knife. Give your best shooter the rifle, and your second best the pistol, with the knife going to whoever's left. Bonus points if this colonist also has the brawler trait, but it's not essential. Next, let's look at the work tab. This tab shows you what tasks your pawns are currently assigned to, and their priority level. To get a bit more granular control, hit this button to go into manual priority mode. This way you can give each colonist a customized list of tasks, and prioritize each one from highest, a one, to lowest, a four. Don't read too much into these priorities just yet, but there's just a couple of basics you'll want to cover right away. First off, set firefight, patient, basic, and bed rest to priority one. These are the tasks you want your colonists to drop everything to do, and should be self-explanatory. However, for the sake of completeness, Firefight means your pawns will put out fires in the home zone. Patient means they'll go to a medical bed when they're due to get some kind of emergency treatment. Basic covers any simple tasks such as flipping switches. And bed rest will send your colonist to a medical bed to recuperate from any non-life-threatening injuries or illnesses. Next, you'll want to set doctor, warden, growing, construction, and cooking to priority one on the colonists that have the highest associated stat and turn it off for everyone else. Doctor colonists will tend to the sick, give them medicine, perform treatments, and deliver food to your injured or ill colonists. Wardens will manage, chat, and feed prisoners, and will also perform any attempts to recruit them. Growing pawns will plant and harvest crops, as well as forage for wild plants. Construction colonists will build, repair, and deconstruct assigned structures. Cooks will prepare meals and butcher animals for meat where available. This will cover your essential tasks and make sure for the most part that none of the day-to-day -day busy work gets missed out. After this, set any tasks your colonists are passionate about to priority two, which means they'll pick those tasks up whenever the essential tasks are finished. Any other task should be set to priority four. For now, while you're in the very early stages, you should also set hauling to priority one, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. With the work tab sorted out, it's time to take a look around your new home and get a feel for the terrain. Here's a couple of things to keep in mind while doing some recon. Where are the steam geysers that you can use for geothermal power later on? Are there any natural choke points to make a kill zone to trap raiders in? Are there any exposed veins of compacted steel, machinery, or other metals? Are there any standing structures that you can make use of? While you're at it, check the ground for any materials that you can use. When you find some, make sure to click them and click the allow button so that your colonists can pick them up. Once you've scouted out the map, select a suitable spot for your initial base camp. Pick a spot near your landing spot so you can get set up quickly. And remember, you can always move somewhere more ideal later. You need to get a single wooden building up ASAP so that your colonists aren't left sleeping outside and so that you can get your materials undercover quickly. Even if you plan on digging out a mountain base, building a temporary structure with wood is going to be the most efficient thing to do at this stage. To construct the building, first go to your architect menu and select structure, then click on walls. 
You could right click to select different materials, but wood will do for now. Drag your walls around to make a building big enough for a 9x9 space. Oh, and then add a door, because otherwise what you have is an inaccessible wooden box. Then, in your architect, go into furniture and put down three wooden beds. Make sure to unforbid the wood you land it with, so your colonists will use it to build with. Try not to use steel for building anything at this stage unless you can't avoid it. Instead, just cut down some nearby trees and use the wood for everything you can in the beginning. Just select any nearby trees and select the chop wood option. Or better yet, in your architect menu, go to orders and then select chop wood and drag a box around the trees you want to harvest. Any abandoned buildings nearby with walls and doors you can steal? Even better, build around them to save you some time. Got all that done? Good. Hit the space bar, let your colonists get to work. Remember, you can change the simulation speed by using the 1, 2 or 3 keys or by hitting the corresponding buttons on the bottom right of your screen. You'll notice once the entire building is enclosed that your pawns will automatically build a roof to cover the room. There is a way to remove the roof from a given area by altering which zones your pawns will allow roofs on, but that's not important right now. Now you remember I said you should get your materials under cover quickly? That's because anything other than metal left outside for too long will eventually deteriorate. Once you've unforbidden any items dotted around the map, you'll need somewhere to put them. In your architect menu, select zone and pick stockpile zone. Drag an area that covers the entire floor of your building. You can select what materials and items get stored in each stockpile, but I'll tell you all about that later. Next, you're gonna to wanna to start thinking about food. You see those little yellow squares in your landing zone? Those are packaged survival meals, and they're your best friend in the early game. Your colonists will survive on them for now, but they won't last. With that in mind, you want to start growing some food. Check the ground around your base for some darker looking soil. This is rich soil, which is super fertile. You can confirm this by mousing over it and checking the text pop up at the bottom left of your screen. If there's no rich soil available, any old soil will do, but rich soil should be your priority where possible. Back in the zone menu of your architect, select growing zone and create two or three plots of at least five by seven in the soil. Make one plot for potatoes, which is picked by default, and another plot for rice. Rice grows more quickly than potatoes and provides a lot of nutrition if planted in rich soil. If one of your colonists happens to have a growing skill of eight or higher, plant heel root in your other patch. You can use this as medicine later on. If not, just plant more potatoes for now. Corn provides tons of food, but takes longer to grow than both potatoes and rice. So I wouldn't worry about planting any unless you happen to have a lot of space to grow in. And if you have loads of space, Consider growing some cotton too. Your pawns will now go about their business, sewing, building, and hauling whatever you've assigned for them, eating and resting as they see fit. Nothing much happens at nighttime at this point of the game, so feel free to fast forward through it if you want. While your colonists are resting is a great time to check out their moods. To check this out, select the colonist you want to check in on and click on their needs tab in the character sheet. There's not much you can do about things like awful barracks debuffs for now, but you can always check to see if there are any easily addressable problems you can find. Is your nudist unhappy they've been forced to wear clothes? Is your brawler carrying a gun? These are easy wins and you should grab them when you can. Next, you'll want to check the schedules tab. By default, your pawns will all go to bed around the same time every evening. And there's no real need to change it unless one of them has the night owl trait and wants to sleep through the day, or if they have the abrasive trait and you want to keep them away from your other colonists. When the base gets bigger, an ideal sleeping pattern is about seven hours of sleep, two hours of recreation after they wake up, a full day's work, followed by two hours recreation before bed. For now, all you need to do is make sure they get enough sleep and the rest will take care of itself. The next few days should be about setting yourself up with the resources you'll need to begin building your colony. This starts with gathering more supplies, namely wood, food, and steel. Now, remember how I taught you to use your architect to select trees to cut down for wood? Well, you can do the same with mining too. First, find the exposed ore you want to mine. Use the mine tool to select the blocks you want to harvest and just let your pawns do the rest. You can even do the same for foraging. If your biome allows it, you can use the harvest command to forage berries, fruit, and even wild heel root to give your pantry a bit of a boost while you wait for your crops to grow. Some foods like berries can even be eaten raw without giving your colonists a mood penalty, so it's worth having them around. Berries in survival meals might not be enough to feed your starving pawns, however. You might have to hunt some of the local wildlife to keep your food supplies up. To do this, just select whichever animals on the map you want to go after, then click the hunt command. A word of warning, there are several types of animals you don't want to go hunting at this stage. These include boom rats and boomalopes. As the name suggests, 
These go boom when they die. And if you're too close to them when it happens, you're going to have a bad time. Animals in packs. Animals have a chance to decide to seek revenge when you hunt them. And an animal in a pack has a chance of bringing the whole pack down on you if you're unlucky. Predators. They're pretty self-explanatory. But if you must know, they're fast and have big teeth. And when they decide on revenge, you'll be the one who turns into a meal and not them. Once your pantry is full, it's time to get cooking. Cooking works a bit differently from the other tasks we looked at so far, as it requires its own workbench and a mechanic called Bills. In your architect, select production, then pick out a stove. If you think you can wait till you have electricity, which is the next step, pick the electric stove. Otherwise, choose the fuel stove, which will need to be periodically topped up with fresh wood to keep it going. The electric stove will save you materials in the long run, so if you can hold off, it's best to pick that. Up. Place it down in your temporary shelter to get one of your pawns to build it. Once you've got it up and running, select the stove and click the Bills tab before clicking Add Bill. Select Cook Simple Meal to add that bill to the stove. Then change do x times to do until you have x, changing the number to anywhere between 10 and 20 meals. This will mean that your cook will always prepare meals with available supplies until it has reached that number and should replace any that are eaten as long as there's enough raw food to make it from. But what about those dead animals clogging up the place? You can't just bung that on the stove, can you? Well, there's another step we need to take before we can use their meat which is butchering. Your cook can still do this, but will require a butchering table to do it. When you can, select the butchering table from the production menu on your architect and place it down wherever you have space. We'll want to set up another bill for butchering, but this time we'll do it slightly differently. In the add bills menu, select butcher creature, but where you originally selected do until you have X, change this to do forever. Meat won't always be on the menu, so it's hard to say exactly how much you'll have at any given time. We get around this by just butchering whatever we have when we have it and storing it as raw meat until it's needed. The upside of butchering all these animals is that it'll also provide you with leathers and furs that you can produce clothing from later. Clothing uses the bill mechanic as well and is produced mainly at the tailor's bench. Right off the bat, you might want to use some of these to make parkas and tukes for the winter, but we'll get to that in a minute. You aren't going to get much further in this game without power, so electricity should be your next port of call. Your options right now are the wood fire generator or wind turbine. The wood fire generator outputs a steady thousand watts of power, but you guessed it, needs to be regularly topped up with wood to keep going. The wind turbine, on the other hand, can output anywhere between 150 and 3000 watts, depending on the wind speed, but doesn't require refueling. It also requires an area under blocked by trees to operate. If wood is plentiful, which it should be if you chose temperate forest, I would pick the wood fire generator for now and maybe diversify into wind turbines later if you prefer to take power from a mix of sources. Please note, unless you're going to tame a big gang of boomalups in your first week on the rim, don't even bother with the cam fuel generator for now. It's not worth the components. In the power section of your architect, select the wood fire generator and plop it down next to your building. Any electrical equipment near enough to the generator should attach itself to it automatically and start drawing power. Note that every item has its own power draw measured in watts and you'll need to expand your power supplies as you grow your colony. With power out of the way, the next thing you'll want to do is build yourself a freezer. This is a standard building with a cooler used to refrigerate your meals and raw food. To build a freezer, start by setting yourself up a seven by seven storage zone and build some walls around it, leaving two openings, one for a door and one for a cooler. The cooler can be found in the temperature section of your architect. When building the cooler, make sure it's near your generator so it can draw power and that the blue side of the diagram faces the inside of your building when you place it. When you've built the cooler, set the target temperature to minus 5 degrees Celsius or around 23 degrees Fahrenheit so that nothing in the freezer will rot. Now remember how I said you could select what gets stored in each stockpile? Select your new stockpile and hit the storage tab. For your freezer, you want to allow only items you need frozen. So click clear all, then set it to allow fresh food and animal corpses, but forbid anything rotten. There are two ways to stop your foodstuffs from being sent to other stockpiles where they might rot. The easiest way is to change the priority on your freezer stockpiles to important so that food goes there first. The other way is to disallow foods from being stored at your other stockpiles by deselecting them in the storage tab. It's worth noting that the cooking and butchering processes create 
a certain amount of mess and dirt, which can affect whether or not your ponds get food poisoning. To avoid this, it's worth building a separate kitchen near your freezer to produce your food in, and adding floors to the freezer and kitchen to minimize dirt levels. Any floor is better than no floor, but sterile tiles are the best for the job when you manage to get the tech for them. The last thing you'll need at this stage is to start researching new technologies. You'll never get off world with wooden huts and tattered clothes, right? Find the research bench in the production section of your architect and plop it down wherever there's space preferably indoors. You'll find the full tech tree in the research tab at the bottom of the screen, and at first glance it is pretty daunting looking. Don't worry too much about anything too far up the tree for now though. Right now there are only two key techs you need to worry about. The first is solar panels. They'll allow you to generate a steady amount of power during daylight hours without the need for refueling, and they're a great step up from wood fire generators. But their main drawback is they do not generate power at night. So how do you get the benefit of them after dark? With the second tech on our list, batteries. Batteries will store any excess power for you to use when you can't generate any from the usual sources, such as sunlight. By the way, to connect all these generators and batteries, you can build power conduits from the power section of your architect to create a makeshift power grid. Pretty neat, right? To get these techs out quickly, set one of your pawns to have research as priority one. After that, you can take research at a more relaxed pace, so feel free to drop it down and pick out whatever techs you think are going to be the most beneficial to you. Up until now, everything has been a walk in the park, but that all changed when the Fire Nation attacked. And by Fire Nation, I mean a local squirrel going mad because of a rogue psychic pulse, or perhaps a single raider with a rubbish club and delusions of grandeur. Nevertheless, fighting is one of the room's only constants and you'll need to be ready when it comes. To get your colonists ready for war, select them and hit the draft button. This will put them under your direct control until you release them. So don't forget to do that, otherwise they'll just stand around and survey the battlefield for hours when the fighting's already done. Once they're drafted, get them set up in an area where they have a good line of sight for where you think the enemy will approach from. Get into the habit of putting them into whatever cover you can find, such as trees, walls, sandbags, and even rock chunks. Any cover is better than none. If your shooters get overrun or are just terrible shots, it's time to send in your melee fighter. Make sure to send them in at an angle to make sure they don't get hit by friendly fire. When you're ready, just select your pawn, right click the enemy, and proceed to give them a good stabbing. Any animals you kill can go straight in the freezer for the next butchering session. So technically can any dead humans, but that is called cannibalism and is, despite what Reddit might make you believe, frowned upon. Not only that, but your colonists will get a mood debuff for witnessing human-like corpses lying around, like a bunch of crybabies. Am I right? To get rid of them respectfully, you can dig them a grave and haul their bodies into it. To get rid of them disrespectfully, you can build a stone room with a dumping stockpile and dump them in there until you get your hands on a cremation bench or some Molotov cocktails, whichever you happen to come across first. But what if the raider you downed didn't die right away? Well, how are you considered imprisoning them? To do so, you need a prisoner bed or sleeping spot for them in a building separate from where your colonists sleep. In a pinch, I have been known to throw down a sleeping spot in the kitchen. That tends to do the job. Once you've captured them, you have a few options as to what to do with them next. To check their stats, head over to the bio tab on their character sheet. Are their skills any good? You might want to try to recruit them. On the prisoner tab, select recruit and check their resistance. This is a guide to how long it'll take to recruit them. The higher the number, the longer it'll take. If they're not particularly good, you have a few options. The first is not capturing them at all and finishing them off, or even letting nature take its course and have them bleed out on the battlefield. Wow. Bleak. The kindest thing you can do is tend to their wounds and send them off on their merry way back home. This will improve relations with their home faction in most cases. Otherwise, you can execute them if you just want them off your hands. On the less humane end of the scale, and yes, there is a less humane option than execution, you could consider selling them off to a passing slave trader, or better yet, harvesting their organs for your own use. Human leather cowboy hat, anyone? Your first few seasons will likely play out like this. Crops will grow and be harvested, animals hunted and tamed, meals cooked and eaten, new outbuildings and new production benches will start piling up, and your colony will eventually expand. But unless you've picked a biome with a permanent summer, the only inevitability is that winter will eventually arrive. 
Your crops will be the first thing to go, as well as most of the other plants on the map you'd normally be able to forage. Although hunting might still be a viable option depending on your local wildlife, in most situations you'll want at least a thousand units of food stored away. This could be kept as raw food until it's needed, with meals only needing making as and when you start running out. Heat is a whole different problem. Hopefully you'll have taken my advice and used some of those animal pelts to produce some tukes and parkas for when your colonists inevitably have to go outside. Indoors you can use heaters to keep your rooms warm for your colonists as they go about their business. Keeping your spaces at around 21 degrees celsius or 70 fahrenheit will stop your colonists from complaining too harshly about the cold. Much lower than that and you run the risk of them suffering from hypothermia and frostbite. Wow even more bleak. On the other hand, if it snows, your colonists will use their downtime to build snowmen, which will give them a joy bonus, which is really as wholesome as this game is going to get. It's pretty safe to say that I'm glossing over a whole ton of stuff that's going to happen between the early and late game in RimWorld, but ultimately a lot of what happens next is going to be based on the same loops and mechanics that you first experience in the early game, so it's not hard to extrapolate out the next steps. However you choose to move ahead, in the base game there are really only three possible outcomes for how the game ends. First of all, there's the bad ending. All of your colonists die, and the colony is abandoned to the ravages of the Rim. You and your kin are forgotten, at least until some other set of plucky adventurers comes along to find the ruins of your once burgeoning colony and learn about the hubris, which eventually led to your downfall, and probably steal your stuff. The other two endings, however, are a lot less bleak. The traditional ending to the game is where you and your colonists build a ship of your own and escape the planet. This is a lengthy process and requires a good deal of planning and research. You'll need tons of plasteel and advanced components, which can be crafted or purchased occasionally from traders. You'll also need an AI persona core, which can be found only as a rare trade item. And even then, once the ship is built and you prepare to take off, the launch sequence can attract all sorts of enemies who will want to ruin your fun, and you'll have to fend them off before being able to soar into space. The other method comes as part of a quest line that turns up in the early game. A friendly AI will send you a message telling you about a ship they've got stored somewhere on the planet. It'll be a treacherous journey, and its location will often be weeks away by foot. You'll need supplies and pack animals sturdy enough to get you all the way there. On the way, you'll be beset by multiple obstacles, such as ambushes, mad animals, mental breaks and illness. And even when you get there, you'll have to entrench yourself for the inevitable wave of enemies that'll be hot on your heels once you switch the engines on. Either end to the vanilla game is a huge undertaking. They both certainly have their perks, but I wouldn't say one is any easier than the other. Other. so think carefully before you decide which route to take. And that's it! That's everything you need to know to get started playing RimWorld. I started writing this script at 8pm on a Friday and didn't finish till nearly 2am the following morning, yet I'm certain there are probably a few things I've missed. So if there's anything glaring I haven't pointed out, or any points you want me to cover in another video, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Thank you! for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it or you learned something, I'd super appreciate it if you left a like on your way out. I make new RimWorld videos every week, so if you want to see some of my own antics on the Rim, make sure to subscribe. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got a score to settle with Randy. And as always, thanks for hanging out.